If I could please get a show of hands of anyone who knows what it's like your first few days starting a new job. There we go. You know, you, you, get in, you get into work, you know, does your hair look good? Are you underdressed or are you overdressed? You know, you've got enough makeup, not enough makeup, get in the orientation going. You can see by the show of hands, Glenn, that, who, that we share in what you're going through today. There's the, the excitement and the anticipation. You know, there's also the nerves. So I'd ask you also, I've got a homework assignment for you. Think about when you were in those situations, what people that were around you did to make you feel more comfortable, to make you feel at home, to make you feel welcome. And think about that as, as Glenn and, and his wife, Teresa, and his, and his sons, as they transition into the Wellington Square family. Think about things that you can do to support and to help. The other nice thing that we share in common here, Glenn, is that we're all followers of Jesus. So you're amongst friends here. You know, your hair looks great today. You're properly dressed. <laughs> so we're off to a good start. We're off to a very good start. So please help me to welcome Glenn and his family to the Wellington Square family. Heavenly Father, thank you for this blessed day. It's, it's come with such anticipation, and you bring us such joy. Over so many years here at Wellington Square, you have, you have continued to bless us with such great ministry staff, and, and Glenn is no exception to that. We ask you that to continue to fill him with the Holy Spirit, continue to, to help him to feel comfortable here, a part of this Wellington Square family. It's a joyous day, and we all like to celebrate. And we continue to do this as followers of Jesus, brothers and sisters in Christ, in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning. Uh, good to be here with you this morning. And uh, well, I said to the church when I was leaving, I said, it won't be real until I stand before them and preach my first sermon. Got up this morning and I was getting on the link and instead of turning right for the last 13 years, I turned left down into Burlington and it, it seems like a whole new place and yet I, I'm not about my agenda, I'm about what Christ would want me to do and, and that gives me great comfort. Um, he has led me here and, and I just want to pour out my heart this morning about what the scorecard, what my scorecard, what, what I long to do for the Lord here in your midst because I'm sure you're wondering what kind of pastor is he? And, and, and what's his agenda? And um, over the years, like, where is he going to take us? And, and so I want to walk through uh, this wonderful passage of Scripture and identify for you this morning where I long to take you with the Lord's grace and help, where, where I hope we can go together as a congregation of believers. Is that okay with you? It's good with you? There's a picture up here. You see it? I mean, I love that picture. I mean, you, can, you know that's a happy time. And, but I, I, it could be a fake time. It could be one of those poses. But that's where I want to go, that, that, that we could go to that place, that place where, where it's not fake, where everything in your soul jumps up and says, praise God. And there's nothing phony or false or fake that in us, in the depth of our soul, we are just so overwhelmed with God and goodness and glory and love that we can't help but do that. And not just four or five people, but as many as we can. And, and that's my goal is to be that kind of pastor who helps to lead to that place of revival, renewal, transformation. We see this picture through the narrative of Scripture in Revelation 21. We see a whole people of God, those that have come to Christ and received the gift he has given them, we see them in a place in which this is every moment of every second of every day. My goal as a pastor is to help get as many as I can there. And so I chose the passage of 
this wonderful story of Naaman. 2,800 years ago it was written. And, and I wondered, why do we care in a day of iPhones and uh, Internet, in, in a day of all its technology? I mean, so much has changed, hasn't it? Why would we look back 2,800 years to find inspiration to help us live today? What is it that's in the book of the Bible that could inform us? And, and why should we study God's Word? Why not study psychology today? Why not just have a book review? What is it about God's Word that's living and active and powerful? And, and so as a preacher, it's God's Word that inspires me and brings to life. And that's what I'm going to be about, is by God's grace, bring it to life. You see, Paul begins to let us know, know that the Old Testament is, is more than just a, a, a hard book to understand. He will say in 1 Corinthians 10, he will talk about it as an illustration for us who believe. That, that packed in the Old Testament are, are stories and examples. In fact, it was written for us who believe. So powerful are the stories of the Old Testament that we find that Jesus, the Son of God, memorizes them. And he's able to fight the evil one as he rightly divides the word. Jesus himself in Luke will reference Naaman as one who was one who had true faith in a world that had forgotten. Amazing, eh? But when we go to the Old Testament, we wonder, well, how do we understand what is there in the Old Testament? How do we, how do we grasp it? It seems so hard to grasp. And, and Paul will be talking to his apprentice, Timothy. And, and he's, he's kind of just talking and he's writing. And, and papyrus is really expensive. It was, it was like the old days. You remember when you had to pay for minutes on your telephone? Yeah, that's a long time ago. And, and, and so you, you wanted to make sure... Uh, it went long. I know a lot of young people wouldn't get that, but I mean, it was like a buck a minute. And so you, you kind of shrunk those conversations down. And so Paul's shrinking down a conversation. He's talking to Timothy. And by the way, all these references you'll get on Tuesday, I'm going to have for you what's called the coach's corner. And so the sermon and the main points will be there. And so you can go back and make sure I'm not making it up. So on so, so Paul is looking. Uh, uh, he's giving a, an illustration to Timothy about the kingdom. And, 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 he, and he uses three references. It's like a farmer. It's, it's like a, um, an athlete. And I forgot the third reference. But, but he, he, he leaves it there and he says, but you should talk to the Lord and he'll give you more understanding. And so what Paul is identifying is that, that when we get into God's word... That God will give us understanding. And, and when we begin to open up the stories that God has written for us in the Old Testament, God, as we look at it, it's like a 3D book. Remember those 3D books? And, and, and at first you go, I don't get it. You, you know what I mean? Like everyone else sees it and you don't. Ever been there? I'm like the last guy to get it. But if you cross your eyes in just the right way, you know it's there, right? You know it's there. And I overdo it. I overthink. And there's no way my eyes are crossing. But eventually, all of a sudden, you've got it, right? And that's what Paul is saying, that, that when you begin to open up God's Word, the, the Holy Spirit comes and He begins, to, not in a moment, you see. And that's the problem. In our day of instant everything, it, it takes some time. And, and so as you're opening up God's Word, you see, and you're meditating on it. These are examples for us for today, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10. And then all of a sudden, boom, it comes to life. And you go, whoa, this is cool. So as I was looking at Naaman, guess what happened? Whoa, it came to life. And I want to share what God showed me as I was looking at the story of Naaman, and how it will lead us down the pathway of revival. All in favor 
of moving down that pathway, learning a little bit about how we can be at that state. Well, first thing, Naaman. Now, he was a guy who was a great leader of his day. In fact, he was so esteemed, we're told in the first bit of the of First Kings, that, that the, the king held him in great esteem. And the reason why, he was a great commander. There was another superpower at the time, and Naaman was able to take this power and able to win some battles. Naaman was the kind of guy you'd want on your hockey team. He was the kind of guy that when you got him on the hockey team, your team won. He was the guy that you want on the Raptors. Hey? And, and when he's on your team, next thing you know, you're taking home the championship ring. Now, now, now Naaman is that guy. And he has absolutely everything we're told. Except he's got one problem. He's got leprosy. Sometimes we can go through life and we can have everything. And yet, there's a moment where the reality of death dawns on our heart. It, it, it may happen when someone close to you dies. It, it may happen when you get a diagnosis and you're wondering what's up. But Naaman, not only is he one of these superstars, he also is an enemy of God's people, Israel. He went and sacked a few villages and took a few of the slaves. And Naaman represents someone who does not deserve God's help. The beginning of revival comes when we begin to realize that we need a redeemer and we are not it. As good as we might be and as good as our track record is, there are some problems that we cannot overcome in ourselves and in particular death. And then Naaman begins to listen. There's something about when you've got a problem that you can't solve. You can try and deny it or minimize it or rationalize it, but it wakes you up at night. It gets a hold of you. You know what I mean? And, and, and you try to not wrestle with it, but it wrestles you down. And I want to let you know that's the first step of revival. That's God. That's God making sure that you don't stay a, a, asleep anymore, that you, you, you wake up to the, the cliff that's just around the corner. I remember I was a Naaman when I was about 17 years old. I'd gone to a United Church, and, but somehow, I don't know how, it was a time of the Cold War, and we saw these videos of Russia going to blow us all up. And as a young guy, I took it to heart. And then all of a sudden, I started to get depressed. I'm going to live my life, and I'm going to do a pretty good job of it, I'm sure. I'm going to die. And what will this have been? And that just downloaded into my heart. And all of a sudden, I felt like Naaman. You know, I'm going to die. What do I do? And then all of a sudden, in the high school, there was an announcement. There was this inner Christian fellowship meeting. I don't know why, but I decided to go. They weren't very cool. They were not very hip. They weren't the jocks, or they weren't part of my crowd. And so I went in and and I sat with this motley crew of people. But there was something that made me want to stay with them. There, there was something that they had. I couldn't explain it. Naaman, he went home and the word got through to his wife and this little slave girl. And, and she said something that was just most remarkable. She said, there's someone, there's a prophet who can help you. Now, if I were Naaman, what would I have said? I who have conquered armies, I'm going to trust a little slave girl? I mean, what kind of nonsense is that? But that's how God is sometimes, you see. There is something that res resounded in Naaman to say this is truth. And God's spirit was already at work in Naaman and God's spirit was already at work in me and this helpless, hopeless group of Christians in a high school. 
Have you been there? Have you been to the place where you realize you need a redeemer? That there's some problems so big you can't overcome. And then someone says something about this Jesus. That there is one. That there is hope. There's one you can get to. And you throw all reason aside and and you just, you know, and somehow you know that you need to make your journey. And so that's what Naaman does. He goes to the king and the king of Aram and he begins to ask for some letters. I guess he needed a bit of a passport and he gets together a whole lot of money and resources and he makes his way to the king. <clears throat> And, and, and the letter goes to the king, and it's amazing. You know, some people that you think should know where the hope is have no idea. The king thinks this is the great Syri- The Syrians are going to be attacking, and this is going to be a pretense for, for attacking them. And he's tearing his clothes. He, who can help except God? I'm not God. But there's one who knows God. And, and, and this one who knows God, guess what he says? Send them to me. Send, send Naaman to me. I got on a, on a, I guess it was a, a van and got my way to Barry from Sault Ste. Marie to Barry with all of these Christians, kind of wondering what I got myself into. Um, they were the most nerdish people I've ever met. <laughs> I couldn't talk to them about anything that was relevant to me. Then I went into this high school with 700 nerdy other Christians. And they would gather in this like auditorium and sing praises to this Jesus. They tried to play basketball, but no one could really play. <laughs> I remember I was billeted in Barry with this old couple, older than my grandparents, by myself, alone thinking, what did I do? But there was this prophet of God, this woman, her name was Rebecca Pipper. She she wrote a book, Out of the Salt Shaker and Into the World. And she was speaking. And she pointed to this. She pointed that there is this Jesus who is so amazing that helped. And she had this incredible relationship with this Jesus, one who loved her. One who swallowed up death for her. One who, who, who helped her through every decision and all through life. This one who wouldn't leave her or forsake her. This, and day by day, as she began to proclaim the good news, I wanted it. I wanted him. I wanted this life. I wanted this death darkness that was deep in me to be gone, this sin. Ever been there? Where... The good news is so great, even though there's a part of you wrestling with it. You think, even if if it's false, what do I have to lose? So what? So what if I believe in this Jesus and at the end it's immaterial? I will have lived a good life. I was wrestling the whole time. Naaman comes and he hangs out with a prophet. And the prophet says... To Naaman, he sends a second in command, just a humble Naaman a little bit. And he says, you know, if you go to the River Jordan and wash yourself seven times, you will be healed. Naaman was absolutely furious. You mean that little rinky-dink river that you're going to tell me to go into that river? We got better rivers where I come from. He was so upset. And then someone said to him, Hey, Naaman, if he had asked you to do any great thing, you would have done it. Why not do this thing? What do you have to lose? And so Naaman did it. Naaman got to the river Jordan. And he went in. I remember the last day of this conference, uh, Every eye should have been closed, and every head should have been down. And Rebecca Pipper asked, all who want Jesus? Do you want Jesus? 
Do you want your death to be taken to his cross? Do you want his righteousness? Do you want to be adopted as a son or a daughter of him? I thought, why not? Like, why would you say no to this offer? You'd have to be a fool. Well, I don't know, but they didn't really oil the seats of those um, uh, in the auditorium, at least not mine. And, I, and so when they asked for people to stand up, I, I stood up, and all you could hear is this. <laughs> But what happened next was the most amazing thing. That's what happened next. There was a peace that passed all understanding. It filled my heart. I knew. I knew something had happened. I I knew I was different. I knew the offer was valid. I, I knew it was true. The River Jordan... The river Jordan, you see, it's a river where people, the people of God exited Pharaoh and the desert in 40 years. It it, it took a little while to get the river Jordan. They had to learn uh, the Ten Commandments. They had to learn to trust God. They needed to to eat manna and and follow God by the fire at, at night and the cloud by day and trust God. But they got to a place and they went through a leadership shift They got a new guy, and eventually they were at the River Jordan, and it looked impossible. Hmm. But they were called into the River Jordan. Sometimes the gospel seems impossible. How can God intervene in those places where we're filled with anxiety and worry? And he calls us again to the River Jordan. He called John the Baptist to proclaim the good news. And and John says, repent because the king is coming. Make straight way and get to the River Jordan. And so they baptized in the River Jordan. At the River Jordan, Jesus, the Messiah, came and he was baptized. And then the Holy Spirit descended upon him. See, that's what happens at the River Jordan, you see. The, the, The moment, Ephesians would say, that the moment that we hear the good news, that there is someone that God has sent a redeemer because we cannot redeem ourselves. He can redeem us from all that is destroying us. And when we get to the River Jordan, when we get to that place where we realize we cannot do it, where we humble ourselves and we get on our knees and we say, oh God, have mercy on me. If there is one salt of truth to this good news, I want it. Please. the River Jordan. Paul would write that the moment we believe we are sealed with the Holy Spirit, that there's a a sealing that happens, there's a a destiny that we're part of, you see, and I'd say most of you are sealed already. I mean, why would you be here on a Sunday when you have so many good restaurants (laughs) here in Burlington? Why would you be here when this is rated number one community in all of Canada? That came out just before I came here. I think the people in Hamilton are upset now. <laughs> yeah, he went to Burlington. He probably had the, you know, the inner. <laughs> There's a moment, you see. So you're sealed, and you've got to know that. You, see, you need to know that you're sealed, because, because when you leave the River Jordan, it's no easy picnic. When the people read... Remember, this is an illustration for us. When the people of Israel went through the River Jordan, guess what they had to do? It wasn't that. It was a battle, wasn't it? It was, their enemies were there. They needed to take over the land. They weren't magically, mystically transformed. No, no, no. They had God with them. And with God, they could overcome the things they were trying to overcome them. They had to go around Jericho. They had to listen to God, get God's strategy, walk around it, boom. When God told Naaman to go to the River Jordan, he didn't just say, go to the River Jordan. He said, wash how many times? Seven times. Why seven times? Go back to the uh, creation. The first sin was what? Not trusting God's word. Go back to the creation. And God gave 
Six commands. And he looked at them, and they were good. On the seventh, they rested. When God calls us to the River Jordan to, to trust in his word, the living word, the son of God, when he says trust in his offer, well, all that was broken is now healed in him, and we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit that hovered around uh, creation over those six, seven days well, now hovers over us, but now it's hovering over us to what? <laughs> to cleanse us, to change us, to transform us, to work this holiness in us. The church's goal is to proclaim the good news to everyone, to bring them to the River Jordan. But then it's also to teach them to obey all that God has commanded in Christ. And Jesus commands us to be a whole new people, and that's the hard part, eh? He stops. He, he says, don't be selfish anymore. Don't be greedy anymore. That was a tough one for me. I wanted to make a lot of money. How about you guys? <laughs> don't be about your own agenda anymore. I did not want to be a minister, trust me. And there's all these battles that you and I will go through. Ephesians would say this. He would say that we are adopted as his sons and daughters. And, and we are going to be made holy and blameless. And he's going to mature us up so that when they look at us, they'll see the character of Jesus in us. And that's what this ministry is all about. That's what I'm about. Bring everyone to the River Jordan, but then teach them to battle the things that are trying to battle them, that we have to battle the flesh and those things that are trying to destroy us. Because as we do, we find this. We find little victories at time. Why is that important? I don't know. I better hurry up. <laughs> or said, watch how long you preach. I was down to 20 minutes. I said, I don't think so, Orv. I've seen you online. <laughs> and so, and so this, this, the, the role of, of ministry, is, it's hard, right, to teach people to obey all that Jesus commands. There's this battle that will continue between the flesh and the spirit and teaching people to walk in the spirit because it brings this. It's hard. But that's my ministry. That's our ministry. That's what we're about as a church. We're going to bring people to the River Jordan so they can encounter the, the Redeemer, be sealed with the spirit. But then we've got to teach people how to walk and live. And that's going to happen day by day. And how does it happen? Well, by his word. Paul would say that in 2 Timothy 3.16, he would say that, that God's word in here is, is the anvil. It's, the, it's God breathed. To, I better read it because I haven't memorized it. <laughs> but you all know it. I'm sure... Many have preached this word here. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. That every person, every person may be complete and equipped for every good work. That we would mature. Now, that's where we are today. Many of you have, maybe there's some Naamans here. Maybe there's some people that God has impressed on you that, that there's something overcoming you and you can't overcome it. Maybe that's you today. I'm going to say there's a, there's a river, Jordan. There's help. There's a redeemer. And he loves you. And he wants to swallow up all that's trying to swallow you. He wants to give you a peace that passes all understanding. He wants to make you his. And the fact that you're in this place is because he has awakened you to the cliff that's around the corner. And he wants you to avert. And so he's calling out, trust me. And you might be angry. I just call you. What do you have to lose? Just, Jesus, help me. Some of you have been to the River Jordan. You've said the prayer. You've encountered the Holy Spirit. For you this morning, you should be thankful. There's something that started in you 
you're going to mess up, right? I get that. You're going to be a bad Christian, good Christian, bad Christian, good Christian. I get that. You're going to have confession and sin. and I get all that. But your destiny is this. Nothing can separate you from Christ's love. <laughs> Nothing. Your destiny is set. You're homeward bound. It's going to happen. You've been to the river, Jordan. You're going to the promised land. Jesus has made a commitment. And he will honor it. One way or another, he's getting you home. Many of us are in a place where I know I am, where God is convicting me as I read his word, as I reflect on my life, as I interact with the Holy Spirit. There are things in me that are not holy. There's thoughts in me that aren't righteous. There's motives in me that are not pure. And I'm in that place of being washed. And, and so while we're in that place, let's be gentle with each other. Right? Let's not be pointing the finger at another person because you see their sin. No, no, Jesus says, no, work on your own. Look in your own briefcase or your mail and work on that because as you're working on that, it gets really hard and you have no time to be critical of another person. In fact, let's be a culture that builds each other up, that prays for one another, that loves one another, that forgives one another, that comes alongside one another. Let's, let's be such a culture that people come here and they, they say there's something different here. They're not baby Christians. There are the quality of their fellowship is so rich and deep and loving. No, they don't have everything together, but man, they've got a lot together. Well, of course, the story of Naaman doesn't end with Naaman. Uh, he gets the seven washes, he gets back, and he's totally healed. We're not there yet, are we? No, we're not there in the story. But we're going to get there. We're going to get there. And, and, and what, what is faith? Naaman becomes sad. He goes to Elijah. He wants to pay him off. And what does he say? You can't pay off God. That's God's heart. God loves us. He put the river Jordan with his blood so we'd be washed and cleansed. He knows we need a redeemer and he sent him to pay great price. Naaman says, hey, can I grab some dirt anyways? Like, like I don't want to forget this place. And forgive me when I got to go for work into the temple of Raymond, Rimen. And then he says this most amazing thing. Peace be with you. That's the whole path of revival. It comes when there's no peace and and we, we recognize it and we begin to walk. <laughs> and we begin to have ears for a gospel that there's hope. And we step out in faith and we begin to investigate and we come to a place where we hear the good news. And we wrestle and then we receive it. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit. And now we've become, that's called justification. And then we become sanctified, where we work with the Holy Spirit, these wonderful battles before us. And one day we'll be glorified. Where God lifts you up, Dave. Oh, D. Oh, sorry, D. Where God lifts up you, D, and, and, and he says, look at D, look what I did in him. He's like, amazing. And the angels come along and they inspect you and your character and everything about him. And you become a trophy of God's grace. Each one of us. I know it. It's amazing. It's a miracle. I don't know how. But that's the goal. And that's what I'm about. That's my scorecard. That's, I hope, our scorecard. Amen? Yeah, that's the first time anyone's clapped while I preached all the glory to Jesus. I can't wait to advance the kingdom with you. And I know God's done a lot to get me here. So I, I know he's got some good stuff. I'm so excited to be with you. Amen.